So anyway, thank you for, for joining the Coronado Library this evening to meet with Caitlin Rover, the uh, New York Times bestselling and Pulitzer nominated nonfiction writer of the book Death on Ocean Boulevard. So the book brings new research to the mystery surrounding a fascinating and controversial case that took place right here in Coronado within the last 10 years. Um, tonight's event is a partnership with Bay Books Coronado, and you can see um, Caitlin in person at Bay Books on Sunday, May 16th from 12 to 2, where she'll be signing books. And I'm going to be asking her some questions to kick off a conversation, but this is really about hearing directly from the author and an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So please enter your questions into the chat and we'll try to get to them all at the, at the end. So you can see that, um, I think, at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll down there, you'll see uh, the chat down there if you're not too familiar. I think we're mostly familiar with Zoom by now. Um, so first of all, Caitlin, can you tell us how has the reaction to the book been? Well, you know, this has been so exciting for me because <clears throat> it's almost like it was my first book. So Poison Love about the Kristen Rossum case was my very first book that I had come out. And I got on all the TV stations and it was my first book. So that was brand new to me. This time um, I had TV stations actually asking me to come on TV and talk about my book deal. <laughs> so that was two years ago because there was so much anticipation and excitement for this book. So I was hoping that that would continue. And I actually have been thrilled with the reaction that I'm getting. They're, everybody's like, I just got it. I can't wait to get it. I'm about to get it. I'm, I'm waiting for it. Where is it? <laughs> and so it's like a giant book club on Facebook. I, it's, it's been so great. It's, it's very uh, fulfilling and rewarding. And the reviews that, I mean, on Goodreads where people can sometimes be nasty and mean, they're all being really nice. And they're like, this is fantastic. We love it. So, so far, so good. Um, I haven't had any bad reactions, nothing negative. I mean, not everybody loves the book. Obviously, there's going to be a few people that don't like it, but it's much, much more positive than I was even hoping for. So I'm pretty excited. And it, like I said, it feels like, like my first book again. And this is number 14. So that's been, that's been great. That's great. You know, there are there are so many suspects and so much mystery around this this story. It's got all the trappings of a of a good fiction, which is a genre that I know you're familiar with as an author. What do you think it is that makes this story so compelling? Well, to start off with, uh, the circumstances of the way that Rebecca Zahau um, was found in the rear courtyard of her boyfriend's mansion. Her um, boyfriend's brother, Adam Shacknai, called 911 and reported, I got a girl, hung herself in the guest house. So right away, that's a pretty compelling statement. Uh, it turns out that he told police later that she was not in the guest house. He was in the guest house. So right away, that raises some questions. But he said he came out of uh, the guest house after, after waking up early um, and looking at some porno on his phone, he admitted all this to the police and pleasured himself. I'm sorry if that offends anyone, but this is part of the case. It's important. Um, and he came outside and saw this thing that he thought was a mannequin hanging in the courtyard and their teenage kids that are his nephew and niece. And um, he thought maybe it was a joke that they had hung some, some doll or something. Well, it turns out to be Rebecca and she's naked and she's bound her hands behind her back her feet are tied her ankles are tied together and she's also got a gag in her mouth which is a t-shirt that's wrapped around her on top of her hair on top of the rope so right away that's a very unusual set of circumstances also <clears throat> her boyfriend Jonah is a very wealthy man very successful man. He, at the time, was the founder and CEO of Medicis Pharmaceutical Corporation, and they lived most of the year in the Phoenix Scottsdale area uh, in a very nice house, and so they only spent summers here in, in Coronado, and he brought his uh, six-year-old son, Max, and his two teenage kids from his first marriage, so the, the boy was from his second marriage, he was divorced twice and Rebecca was his girlfriend and she helped take care of the kids um, on a part-time basis. 
And um, so you have a wealthy boyfriend, you have a beautiful woman who's hanging naked, and then you have this accident that happened, what was ruled as an accident, uh, the little boy Max, two days earlier, had fallen in a very, also very bizarre situation, somehow fell from the second story rail, over the second story railing inside the house. And Rebecca said that she was inside the bathroom downstairs. She heard a crash, she heard the dog barking, and she came out and she found the little boy on the floor surrounded by broken glass, a big chandelier um, that had fallen from the second story ceiling somehow, a soccer ball and a razor scooter, and then this dog. Now the dog was pretty big and, and Jonah told me that he was big enough to actually knock down an adult. <laughs> he was, could get very excited. So it was a strong dog. <clears throat> So anyway, you have all these circumstances. What ended up happening is the little boy um, wasn't breathing and his heart had stopped. So she had her little sister visiting. Um, she'd just been there for a couple of days, told her little sister to call 911. And she started trying to give Max some CPR and the paramedics came and the police came and they took the little boy to the hospital. So he, it took him 25 or 30 minutes to come back. That little boy was down for quite a long time, but Jonah thought that because she told him that she gave him CPR, that they thought that he would had a good chance of recovering. So th that was, those are the circumstances and that all happened in, in less than 48 hours. So it, it, was, it was a pretty um, set, a set of unusual circumstances. And then after Rebecca was found dead, the little boy ended up dying of his injuries a few days later. Yeah, he was on life support from his head injuries. You mentioned in the, in the book that you've got um, personal insight into suicide, which is what this case was ruled to be. But, and this is a story that you've followed since the beginning, seemingly with a passion. What has the story meant to you? Well, this case caught my attention, just like it caught everybody else's attention. Obviously, it was a very bizarre case, but for me, it had a more personal resonance, and that is because my husband uh, died by suicide, and he hung himself. So I, that was back in 1999, I was working for the newspaper covering um, county government at the time, government in general. Um, so it was very difficult um, because he was the, had been the chief investment officer for the county pension fund. And he was a you know respected guy, but he had had to resign from the county because he was um, a chronic alcoholic. I didn't know that when I married him. Unfortunately, I learned a lot of things about him after we got married. Um, we went into marriage counseling because of his drinking. Um, and the counselor said to me privately, uh, I've diagnosed him as having borderline personality disorder. <laughs> I didn't know any of this before I'd married him. And um, it turns out that some of the things that um, that disorder does to people, it causes them to act out impulsively. It can cause addictions. It can cause you know them to, to go steal things. It causes them to lie. I looked up all these things online and I was horrified because I'd actually seen some of these behaviors, but there were a bunch that I hadn't seen that I thought, oh God, I wonder if he was doing those too. So anyway, the difference though is that I knew that my husband had these problems and um, you know he, he had started drinking again, and I just said, that's it. I have to end the relationship. And a few days later, he hung himself in Mexico. So when this happened, you know, I had that whole experience as context. So it gave me a unique perspective. And I used that as a lens to explore this case. Um, and as I got into the research, it took quite a while for me to even think about this. It took years actually, because I didn't. this didn't occur to me until after the civil trial. So <clears throat> jumping ahead, the sheriff's department, um, as you all know, declared Rebecca's death a suicide and Max, Max's death as the result of a tragic accident. <clears throat> 
Now, a lot of people uh, in town didn't believe that. So when I would come to Coronado, when I would go anywhere, frankly, and I would do a speaker talk, you know, about whatever book I was working on at the time, people would say, are you going to write about the Coronado mansion murder? <laughs> and I would say, well, that's kind of a problem because the sheriff's department says it's not even a crime and nobody's been arrested. Nobody's even been, been labeled officially as a suspect. So <clears throat> people may have some theories, but there's nobody, there's no evidence according to the law enforcement that a crime has been committed. So number one, I could get sued. You can't just go around saying that people have committed murder. Um, <clears throat> But furthermore, I was also concerned, you know, what if she had been murdered? What if the sheriff's department was wrong? And I could, you know, I could get murdered too if I went digging around. So, you know, it took me a while, but years later after the trial, um, the Zahows actually filed a civil lawsuit against um, Dina Shackdye, Max's mother, which is Jonah's ex-wife, her sister, Nina, and Adam Shackdye, who came out to um, be supportive of his brother while his little boy was in the hospital. He flew out from Memphis the day before um, he found Rebecca's body. And he was also named in the lawsuit as well. So the two women were ultimately dismissed. The case went to court and the jury found Adam Shackney responsible for Rebecca's death. So it, it was actually, I went to every day of the trial and I was the only journalist who was there every day of the trial um, because local news doesn't have enough people to sit there every day, all day. <clears throat> so I learned all, all this stuff that the sheriff's department had been holding back, but I, you know, I had the file. I had sources that gave me the file some years before that. So I had the entire investigative file, including detective interviews with Jonah and Rebecca's ex-husband, Rebecca's sisters, some friends, and um, I had all that and some audio uh, as well. So I had all this stuff. There was, you know, autopsy, investigative reports, pictures, photos, the whole thing. So I knew what was new and what was still in those files that nobody else knew. So I thought, wow, there's a lot here. And then I started doing interviews. And by sitting through the trial, by going through the investigative file, and by doing interviews, I did eight interviews that were lengthy, probably two hour interviews, each one uh, with Jonah Shack and I right at the very end um, when I thought I had finished the book and then I had to go back and change a lot and add a lot, which was still really important. I'm glad I did it. It was just very difficult. But I started getting in, you know, once I was interviewing people, I also interviewed um, Michael Berger, who was an ex-boyfriend of hers that she was seeing while she was still married. Uh, she started seeing him, in fact, while she was still living with her husband and told him that she was going through a divorce. So I started learning things about Rebecca outside of the trial, outside of the investigative reports by doing these personal interviews. And I started seeing, coming back to your question, <laughs> I started seeing some parallels um, between some of their behavior. My husband um, the reason he ultimately left the county employment, he was actually in a treatment program, but he went to a conference at the Phoenician Resort in uh, Phoenix, and he was in an alcoholic blackout, and he stole things from the gift shop. Honestly, I, I think he just, I don't know. I got the police report and I read it after he was dead. He, I asked him to show it to me. He would never show it to me. So I didn't get to see it until after he was gone because I found it in a locked briefcase. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, it turns out that Rebecca had also been arrested for shoplifting and they both went in Phoenix and they both went through the same diversion program. It turned out that Rebecca had been telling lots of, lots of different stories to different people in her life. She would tell her family one story. She would tell Jonah another story. She told Michael Berger and her husband different stories. And I didn't know that until I did those interviews because only little pieces came out at the trial and you didn't get a full picture. <clears throat> so, and I'm not saying that I think Rebecca committed suicide just because my husband did. I'm just saying I started seeing some parallels in their behavior. And so the more I got into it, um, the more I the more I learned and the more I put it was able to share with the with people in the book and the readers. 
-hmm. that's a long answer, but that's kind of all encompassing. Yeah. So, I mean, there are multiple theories about what happened that night, aren't there? And, and, you know, plenty of people of interest that are still at large. You don't take a position in the book, but as you research this, how hard was it to resist the pull of so many different sources, each wanting their own version of the truth told? I want to I want to clarify one thing. There was only one person of interest officially, um, and so when you use a term like that, I just you can use it, but I just want to I just want I just want to be careful because I just want people to understand legally we don't want to defame anybody. Adam Schacht and I was the only person labeled as a person of interest, um, and he was cleared by the sheriff's department. So. Um, he's never been arrested. He's never been listed as a suspect. He's never been accused by the sheriff's department. Um, and so therefore there is no criminal case against him because the evidence does not meet the criminal threshold. The civil finding by the jury uh, is a much lesser standard. So it's, you know, more likely than not versus beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what the criminal standard is. So I just want to make that clear. But um, the Zahows have very strong feelings. And so that's why they filed the lawsuit against Adam Shacknai and took him to court and accused him of conspiring and scheming and, you know, um, sexually assaulting her and, and, and killing her, strangling, strangling her and throwing her over the balcony. That is their um, scenario. And the defense says, no, Adam was there, but he was just, um, you know, trying to do the right thing. And he called 911 because he thought she might still be alive and he didn't feel equipped to try to save her. He cut her down and, and called 911 as he was doing it. So it's literally documented on the call. You can hear him dragging the table over. He's grunting and p panting and cussing and talking to her. <laughs> you know, why did you do this kind of thing? It's so it's kind of a bizarre call, but, um, the, you know, the trial, criminal trial, civil trial, you know, attorneys are trying to win a case. So what comes out at trial is never really necessarily the truth. It's probably someplace in the middle, it's, you know, it's theories, you have evidence and different sides analyze and interpret the evidence. So that's what happened in court and the jury believed that it was murder. And because they didn't have a choice, was it Adam or was it someone else? They said, you know, and I didn't talk to the jury but I'm just saying they weren't given a choice. Therefore, they had to say it was Adam if they thought it was murder. So they either all thought it was Adam or they thought it was murder and he's the only one who's accused. I don't really know, I didn't talk to them but I'm just saying that was a defensive a defense is, the defense's strategy was to tie those two questions together because they thought it would be a harder burden to meet. And then the jury said, no, well, we think she was murdered and, you know, and it's Adam. So, you know, Adam believes that he was wrongly convicted and he's been pretty angry about it. He said some pretty e extreme things about Keith Greer, the Zahaus attorney, uh, the Zahaus themselves, and in fact, his own legal team. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, I've been doing this for, uh, since 19, I graduated with a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern in 1987, and I have been a reporter ever since. Um, I did not take a position in this case, because I was trained to be objective, and I honestly have not been convinced either way, 100%, you know, or even 90%. I, I still think there are way too many unanswered questions for me to be able to say definitively that I think it was either murder or suicide. So I, that's the position I took in the book. Um, and that's where I am now. So, and, you know, I, I also want people to remember, you know, that this is not a parlor game. This is not, oh, what happened to Rebecca Zahau? There are two people who died tragically, a little boy and a 32 year old woman and it's sad no matter how you look at it. So I dedicated the book to both of them. Yeah, I, I think you um, touched on this a little bit. And I hear a bit of an echo, I'm not sure where that's coming from. But you know, it's clear from the book that, uh, you know, even getting away from the ulterior motives, 
people's memories are quite often flawed. I mean, uh, we're all familiar with that. You, people tell stories to explain their lives, stories they believe about what's happened, but might not be in agreement with someone else's honest narrative of the same event. So Jonah is a good example of that. Um, as a journalist and nonfiction writer, how do you find your own narrative for the story? How do you pick what, which of the stories you're gonna, what are you gonna do? Well, okay, I wanna, I wanna address the Jonah thing first before I forget. Um, the interesting thing that I found about Jonah is, I, as I said, I wrote the entire book before I taught, interviewed Jonah, and then I had to go back and rewrite entire sections and add new chapters and add new, you know, rewrite and add information. And then I had to cut, cut the book down because it was already too long before I even talked to him. So um, it was quite a, um, an endeavor, but I, I thought it was really important but one of the things, for example, you're saying, what, what do I, what should I believe when, what, how do I choose? So he initially um, told the detectives, and this is the day that her body was found, that he thought she didn't commit suicide, that she wouldn't have committed suicide because he just couldn't see that that's something she would have done to him that it would have reflected badly on him and draw so much attention and to him and his business. And he, he just said, she was such a, she was such a considerate person. She, she was my support. She was my, you know, I just can't believe she would have done this when, I, when Max was in the hospital in the ICU, I just, I can't see, you know, that she did this. Well, today he thinks for sure that she committed suicide. So, so what I do when I, when I, take a book like this, um, you know, when I, to, in order to get a book deal, I have to do a book proposal. And the book proposal basically contains um, an outline, a chapter by chapter outline. And I kind of, I have a story arc. Okay. So I write it like a novel, um, but it's all true. I don't make a thing up, but it, it has to have some surprises. It's like a mystery novel and it has to have some reveals at the end. And so what I try to do is I try to save some surprises and some investigative discoveries that I made. And I kind of try to unfold it the way that, that I experienced the case myself. So somehow, sort of how the public, it, you know, it, it experienced it as well. So I'm kind of rolling out what people knew and then, you know, and, and what I gathered as I was going along. So I'm like the investigator and I'm the one who's unrolling it for you. So it's, it's an authoritative voice, a narrative voice of how I learned about everything. And then there's a lot of stuff in the book that's brand new that nobody knew that I, so I, I unveil it as I learned it in a kind of somewhat chronological fashion. And so what I have to make decisions on what I'm gonna put in and what I don't put in. Um, so just because I put something in doesn't mean I think it's true. I think it's either credible or it has human interest. So for example, there's a scene where there's a psychic who, um, got involved in this case because, um, Bill Garcia, who was a private investigator who had been hired to, um, help Dina Shackney when she was still accused in the civil suit he got into this case and he he's friends with this woman who's a psychic. Um, but he ended up with the bed somehow that Rebecca's hanging rope was anchored to on the second floor in that guest room where the balcony, where she was hanging. Because um, I guess one of the workers who was working on the renovation at the house, at the mansion, um, took it was was given it essentially because Jonah didn't want to go back there you know he just wanted to sell the house and not go back because he lost both his son and his girlfriend there excuse me um so somehow Bill Garcia ends up with this bed and he has it in his garage and this psychic who had already been standing outside Streckle's mansion and said she felt this bad energy from the, the mansion and she said it predated the shack and living there so she said she felt that the Spreckles family who had, you know, built the house in 1908, that, that, that maybe John Spreckles was not a good guy to his wife or something, but she said she felt that energy in the house. Now, I don't, I'm not saying I necessarily believe this is true, that John Spreckles was a bad person, but it is interesting to me. And, and there are 
psychics who work with police agencies. It's not highly publicized, but if you remember, there was a TV show called Medium about a woman who worked, um, I think it was in Arizona, um, with the DA's office, and they were always trying to keep it quiet, but she always knew where the bodies were, right? So anyway, she did a reading on the bed, and she um, touched it, and she started choking, she said, and that happens sometimes when she gets connected to someone who's passed on. But long story short, she said she, that she she got from Rebecca that she had been strangled. And then she was really choking more than she would normally be choking. And then she said she felt like someone was literally strangling her. And Rebecca let her know that that's how she died. And there were two men there and one of them she knew. And so anyway, I put that in the book. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that that's what I think happened, but I think that's pretty interesting. So I thought it was worth putting in. And so, um, and then I have a lot, you know, it's written in scenes. So it's written like a novel in scenes with characters talking to each other. But I have done a tremendous amount of research in order to retell and recreate those scenes. So I have to pick, yes, who I think is the most credible because there's a lot of stuff that I tried, that I researched that went down a rabbit hole and couldn't find any, anything to support it. I, that's, those things are not in the book. So if I thought something was very not credible and somebody was making accusations about somebody killing Rebecca and I didn't name names of any of those theories except in a very general way because you know everybody was getting lumped in in the beginning on web sleuths. That's a website where there are people <clears throat> who decide they can solve cases from their homes you know, on the computer. Uh, don't forget, uh, folks in the audience, um, you know, if you've got a question that you want, um, stick it in the chat, you know, and we'll get to it in, in just a moment. Um, so in addition to the book, I know you've got some stuff on your on your website, CaitlinRother.com. Can you tell the audience what they can find on your site? Yeah, I've got, um, this is my 14th book. So I've got a bunch of stuff on there about all the other books. But in particular, if you're interested in, in learning more about this book, um, there are TV interviews that I've done, podcasts, various other events. And this event will also be recorded if any of your friends say, oh, I missed it. I, I wish I could see it. Well, they can if you just let them know that. Um, the book signing um, at Bay Books is on there, all the events that are coming up. If you wanted to come to anything else, you didn't get your question answered or, or what have you. That's all on the virtual tour calendar, which is on my blog. And the website is caitlinrother.com. Okay, and any, any questions from anyone before we wrap up? I'm not seeing... Um... I see some questions here. Should we get started with those? Yeah, you want to go ahead and um, right. turn, turn sure. to the audience for some questions? I'm not, I'm not committing to answer every question that gets asked, by the way. I'm going to choose, so... <laughs> okay, had Adam met Rebecca prior to the week of her murder, i.e., did they have a relationship prior to the hanging? Uh, yes, Rebecca had met Adam before. Um, Adam had a long, has a long-term girlfriend. There's a picture of the two of them on my website. Um, <clears throat> and Adam had met Rebecca when his father was still alive. And um, Jonah Shackney brought Rebecca to New York for their dad's birthday. And I think they were all at a nightclub uh, listening to a woman Adam is a big music fan and he um, he loves live music. And in fact, I actually ran into him at the, um, what's the name of that hotel? The West, um, anyway, it's right across the street from City Hall, but um, anyway. Uh, so yes, they did know each other. They didn't know each other that well, but um, there was, they weren't close. Um, and when he testified, uh, he was asked, you know, by Keith Greer, you know, did you find her attractive? And he said, she was my brother's girlfriend. Did she ever flirt with you? Or did you feel something? You know, no, no, no. Did you kill her? No. Did you hit her? No. You know, so um, according to Adam, they had a perfectly uh, cordial, friendly relationship, and it wasn't anything more than that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Chris Grant. Hello, Chris. Um, 
I know that Jonah spoke with you late in the process. Whoa, now there's more questions. Hold on, I get, they're jumping around. Um, how did you get him to talk to you? Had you sent him emails or did you talk with Adam or someone else who paved the way? Okay, so that's one reporter asking another reporter how they do their job. So I wanna answer that. Um, Chris was also one of my students when I taught at UCSD Extension. We go way back. Um, and she's in the book, by the way, too. I quote her in the book. Um, okay, so it was late. I, you know, I basically had tried to reach everybody. Um, I, during the trial, um, I handed my business card to Adam Shackney's girlfriend in the bathroom because I wanted to interview her because Keith Greer was basically making a whole show during the trial that she wasn't really his girlfriend, that really he was a sexual deviant and, you know, he, she, he had sexually assaulted Rebecca because, you know, this girlfriend of Adam's was really not as close as Adam was making out, you know. That she, he basically said, that's not really your girlfriend, is it? And, and Adam was on the stand and said, Mary, who was sitting in the gallery, are you my girlfriend? Which you don't do. You always go through the judge. So this was a little bit of a circus atmosphere. And she said, yes. And then basically the judge had to ask her to leave because Keith Greer um, said that she was really could have been a witness and she shouldn't be listening. And so they, the judge asked her to leave the courtroom. But anyway, um, so I talked to her in the bathroom because I thought it would be useful later and it would also maybe help me get to interview Adam, which it did because he then later uh, called me on my cell phone, which I was not expecting. Um, and we did meet for about three and a half hours face to face. I did later interview Mary as well for about an hour and a half on the phone, right toward the end actually. She's a very nice, very nice woman. Um, but I couldn't get Dina Shackney to uh, agree to be interviewed. I couldn't reach, um, she just didn't answer my emails. I sent her um, a letter, she just didn't answer me. So, um, and then her sister, I emailed her, couldn't get an answer from her. Uh, Jonah, I, I met um, one of his PR people during the trial and got her card. And so I gave her, um, he, I, what I heard from everybody though, that he just wasn't talking to anybody and he probably wouldn't talk to me. And he, so, and he wasn't on any of the TV documentaries. Um, he was on 2020 very briefly, which was I think during the trial, which was kind of strange. Um, my voice is getting a little scratchy. I need to eat one of these licorice things. Mm. I've been talking a lot and my voice sometimes starts going. So um, anyway, I went through his former PR firm as it turned out to be former um, and she was on leave or something. And so it took a while for him to get the message, but then he emailed me and then we set up a call and he basically was trying to figure out if he could trust me, asked me a series of questions and then he agreed to do the interview. And I said interviews, and I don't think he knew it was going to be eight of them, or that they were all going to be two hours long. And we had some very, very intense conversations because um, he was convinced by this point that Rebecca committed suicide, and and I know my husband committed suicide, so we were sharing some experiences, um, and that's I think how I got him to talk to me because I opened up about you know, and I said this is all going to be in the book, you know. And and because he had, he had thought I think that I was going to write a more pro Zahao book and attack him and his brother and I said no I'm going I'm doing an objective an objective book I'm not taking sides and so that was partly how I got him to talk to me. Okay, next question. Is it true that Adam was a captain of a ship and that the ties around Rebecca were nautical knots? Okay, so that is a matter of a lot of debate. <laughs> that is what the Zahau's attorney said. They got um, their expert to come in and do a demonstration on a mannequin that was made to look just like Rebecca. It was literally a sex doll. Um, cost quite a bit of money, I guess, to make. 
and had long black hair and had the same colored painted nails and toenails as was in the autopsy report, because I checked, and some bruising that was similar to what was on her neck and around her wrists and her ankles and uh, you know some other injuries that she that were noted. Um, and then he said that he looked at the knots, which were preserved on two cardboard tubes. Um, so they took, apparently they were easy, not that hard to get off her wrists during the autopsy, but they preserved them. And he also had pictures of her when she was tied in the courtyard. So he demonstrated to us on the mannequin some extremely elaborate knots. <clears throat> And he had a uh, nautical experience and he thought they were nautical knots. Um, the defense, however, said that they were very simple knots <laughs> and that anyone could tie them, including a bird. Um, when I talked to Adam, he said he was really upset about that because he said, oh, I couldn't have tied those knots. I don't even recognize those knots. I don't even know how to do those knots. I don't know anything about those knots. So he was upset about his lawyers doing that. Um, and so who knows, uh, you know, the, the sheriff's department did a video where they showed one of the female deputies tying herself up, tying these things around herself in the front, slipping one hand out, putting it behind her back, slipping her wrist back in behind her back. And that's how she said, that's how Rebecca could have done it. The um, Zahau's expert said that that was way too simple. They were not the same knots. Um, that he saw in the video that he saw on the body. So they disagreed about that. That's my answer to that question. Did you interview the detectives from the sheriff's department? Many are not noted in your reference and thanks pages. Um, the, um, that's, that's a good question. I definitely tried. Um, I, was not allowed to come to the either of two news conferences uh, because I don't have a press pass. That was what they told me, even though the sheriff knows me and I've interviewed him personally for a previous book that I wrote on the Chelsea King, Amber du Dubois, John Gardner case, which was actually pretty um, positive about the sheriff's department. So they had no reason to really keep me out that I could see, um, but I was not allowed to uh, ask questions of the detectives directly during any of those news conferences the way the media was. Um, so I sat during the trial and they testified during the trial and I quoted those, some of that. Uh, I also have the investigative reports. I was able to describe what happened. And I also listened to them interview um, Jonah and Rebecca's ex-husband and um, Adam and whatever else. And you know, it's really more when I, when you're writing scenes like that. That's what's most important. I have all that information already. It wouldn't have necessarily added anything. But when I um, did submit questions, I, I was allowed to sit down with some detectives who didn't work on the first case um, after the review, which came after the trial when um, Sheriff Gore initially said we are sticking to our original suicide findings. We are not swayed by the jury verdict um, until uh, Dave Myers, who was running against Sheriff Gore in the campaign at the time, um, said, if I win, I'm gonna reopen a criminal case. And then suddenly Gore decided to do this review, which didn't end up really being all that substantive. According to Keith Greer, the a house attorney, it was just a campaign ploy. Um, they didn't re-interview anybody. They didn't interview anybody new. Um, and I think they ended up testing maybe one or two items for DNA. They didn't retest any of the items that had mixed profiles. Um, one of, at least one of which was not Adam Shacknai and was not Rebecca. So it was an unknown. That was on two or three items. Um, and, you know, you have to remember it's quite a bit of time passed since the original incident and technology has improved and gotten more sensitive. So they could have done that. They didn't do that. There are a number of things that they didn't do during the review that they also didn't do during the initial investigation. Um, and a lot of outside experts who are quoted in my book, um, I discuss all that. But when I went and talked with um, the detectives, I 
they weren't on the original case. So I wasn't, I didn't have access to them. And later when I, I was finally allowed to interview the sheriff and I would ask him questions. He's like, well, I don't know. I the, the detectives handled that. So I asked, <laughs> um, I asked the media relations lieutenant, can I interview um, Detective Sueda? Can I interview Mark Palmer? And no, he's retired. We'll try to reach him, but you know, I don't think he'll, he's gonna be reachable and no Detective Sueda doesn't wanna do an interview. So I did try. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't know what it would have added because I did hear them testify. I did read their investigative reports. Um, and I don't know how much more it would have really added to, to the book. The only thing I would have liked to have asked is, which they wouldn't have told me, but did everybody on the team agree that it was suicide? You know, were there any of the detectives maybe who didn't think it was suicide? I don't think they would have told me, so I don't know what would have mattered. On CBS News, they reported that Adam had watched prior to her death. I don't know what that means. Uh, if you want to resubmit that question and explain what you mean, please, I might be able to answer that. Um, what rumors, mistruths are out there that you want to dispel? Well, one of my goals in writing this book, um, that's kind of a long, complicated question, um, was because there is so much misinformation and speculation and conspiracy theories. And there's a lot of people right now in our country who don't believe in science. <laughs> And, you know, the sheriff's department basically said, look, we had to make a, a ruling based on science, and that is the forensic evidence. There is no DNA or fingerprints that ties Adam to this scene. And so what some people who don't believe that say, well, but it also wasn't found <laughs> even on the items he admitted to touching. So... I wanted to kind of get into some of these inherent contradictions and holes in the in the case. I also wanted to get into really who are these characters? Who who was Rebecca Zahao? What was she really like? Was she a person who was impulsive and reckless and you know made up stories about how she was kidnapped? And these were all these were were um Kind of characterizations that were made by Adam's defense team during the trial. And I wanted to really flesh that out and be more fair and balanced to her and her memory and find out, you know, more of who she was, who was Jonah, and who was Adam, and, you know, and who was Dina. Because, you know, Dina went on TV and she claimed that Adam, I'm sorry, that um, Max was murdered, was a, you know, victim of homicide. And initially, she she didn't she didn't say Rebecca killed him, but she was blaming Rebecca. So her argument was, and she hired experts to to analyze the evidence about Max's death. And um, Jonah hired his own experts, but Dina's experts said that they thought that he had been killed as as opposed to doing something. He was he died at someone else's hand, not that somebody literally tried to kill him maliciously. Um, so I wanted to just explore all of that and lay it all out and put it in a comprehensive and authoritative and somewhat chronological manner so that people can understand. Also, a lot of the information that the sheriff's department did not release, even during the trial. So I just thought there was so much information that, that the general public didn't know. Um, and then give it context. And, and so, you know, there are these theories. Um, and some of them are conspiracy theories. There's, you know, the, I, I wanted to make sure to ask Jonah and to ask Sheriff Gore, you know, there are these allegations that Jonah, you were given special treatment that you had undue influence because of your wealth, um, on this investigation. And I kind of walked him through those questions and I did the same with Sheriff Gore and gave them both a chance to address those because the Zahao family is still continuing to make those. So, I mean, there's a lot here. There's a lot of material here to cover. So I, I did. And there's some in surprises toward the end of the book that you'll see that happened as I was investigating this and things that I found in the file that people had been reading wrong and looked like, oh my gosh, did I solve this case? And then it turned out, oh, well, might be some, some other surprises in there for you guys. Okay, I have a question about the evidence. In the photos, 
I'm going to be reading this quietly here because I don't know if I want to answer this one. I have it. All right, I'll try to answer this one. I don't know if I'm going to be able to properly, but I have a question about the evidence. In the photos, it appears that Rebecca is grabbing the long part of the rope with her fingers. I don't remember left or right hand. This would dispute the plaintiff's theory that she was knocked out or strangled before the hanging. How was this explained? Um, you know, it really wasn't. <laughs> That's so I will try to sort of answer that question, but. Um, the sheriff's department said she had it in her hand and that it was the long part of the rope and that she had pulled that piece of rope to tighten that um, part around her wrists to tighten it. Um, I don't think, don't think that had to do with her, the hanging rope. I think that was just the ones around her hand. But um, you know there there are different interpretations. There are some experts who've looked at those knots and said that they're actually facing the wrong way for that to work. Um, it should be on the bottom when they're on the top or something like that. And I I don't know enough about it to say. But there are different theories about that. So the sheriff is the one who said that 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 was what she was using to tighten it. The plaintiffs uh, expert said that. Um, that the, the knots are tied a, a way that she wouldn't have done it to herself, that somebody else did it to her. Basically, there's a, because they have to be tightened a certain way in a certain direction, it would have been, they weren't tied that way. So it, it was as if somebody else had done it and I can't explain it very well. So I'm not going to try to do that anymore because I'm not going to make as much sense as I want to. That's the best I can do, sorry. The woman who gave the idea in the book that Rebecca was choking on the bed, did she have a good background? Like, what is her history of truth? Okay, I already covered this question. Um, she's involved because she did a reading on the bed and she knows the private investigator who I know personally as well. And I believe that she believed what she was saying and I don't know anything more about her background. Um, the Zahao said the week after Rebecca was found hanging that they would never accept suicide. Do you think there was anything that the Sheriff's Department could have done that would make the Zahaos believe that? Do you think all the media coverage that called Adam a murderer before the civil trial prejudiced the jury against him? So when they do what's called voir dire and they, you know, pick jurors, they ask them, Are you read, have you been reading the news? Did you know about this? I wasn't sitting there through Bardier. I didn't have access to those questions, but they don't pick jurors on a trial if they say that they can't be objective, even if they had read about it. So I can't, you know, it doesn't really matter what I think. I, I don't have a basis to answer that question, but that's the process that they, they did go through it. Uh, I believe they handed out questionnaires as well. Um, do I think there was anything the sheriff's department could have done that would make the Zahaos believe that Rebecca was committed suicide, com had committed suicide? Um, I can't really answer that either because I can't speak for the Zahaos. Um, but I know that they just didn't believe that Rebecca would have done that because they didn't think that there was anything in her history. She had never threatened to commit suicide. She had never mentioned being depressed to them, uh, she had never been diagnosed with any mental illness, but as I mentioned, um, I think maybe her family didn't know everything about Rebecca because she showed different sides to them and to her boyfriends and to her husband. And according to Jonah, um, she wasn't religious when she was with him at all. In fact, she made some negative comments about religion. He said they wouldn't have been together if she had been as religious as her family thought she was. Um, they said she was very modest and never would have been naked in front of anyone. And he said, well, she often um, would be naked in, you know, when they were in bed together. And that's was a natural thing for her that she was very proud of her body and that she worked out a lot and did wore revealing clothes to, you know, midriff showing because she was a fitness nut. They both were. They were both at the gym all the time. They did that together and they ate very healthily and um 
So it's just a matter of opinion. And I, I think that the Zahows have an idea of who Rebecca was to them that they that they have. And I that's just what that's just who they who who she was to them and the person that she knew. They don't believe that the person they knew would do this. I, I don't know if I can say it in any other way. So I don't know, I don't know if there's anything the sheriff's department could have done, but I know that they didn't do enough. Um, I, the Zahows really have a mistrust for the sheriff's department. Um, they don't believe that they were consulted. Um, you know, they don't feel like they were listened to. Um, they feel that the sheriff's investigation has holes in it. And they did not um, want to do, did not want to cooperate with me for the book because um, I was told that Mary was thinking about, her sister was thinking about doing her own book. Uh, Keith Greer, is working on his own book too. So that's what happens with situations like this. So I don't I don't know enough to answer the, that question in any more detail. How do you think Rebecca was physically able to get her body over the rail while bound? Uh, I'm not saying I think she did. <laughs> so there are a lot of um, people who think that that was logistically uh, not possible because for example, there's a toe print in the dust on the balcony. How are you gonna get yourself over the railing by putting your weight on just one toe? <laughs> it didn't really make sense. Why, um, why wasn't her neck broken from a nine foot fall? How would she have known how much rope to cut and leave to prevent her from hitting the ground? How did she even know how to tie herself up like that? How, why would she have tied herself up? I mean, there are just so many questions. So I don't think she, I, I don't have an answer for that question because I don't necessarily think she did, did that. Like I said, I'm not convinced either way. Um, I, something about sorry watched porn. I don't know what that means. I'm, I think I'm missing the first part of this question. Um, thank you for writing this book. I've been following this case since day one. I'm on chapter 20, can't put the book down. I don't believe she committed suicide, but I have a completely different perspective now. Thank you. That's I was. That's what I was hoping, that people would learn something from the book. And maybe they'll change their mind, but maybe they won't. They both had a history of relationship issues, violence, mental health instability. I'm not sure who they both are, but I can't wrap my head around a woman getting naked before thought before taking their life, can you share your thoughts on this simple fact? Well, this the reason one of the reasons this case was so intriguing to me and to everyone else is because this just doesn't happen usually. I mean, I looked up naked suicide on Google. I found one journal article, and it's like you know fourteen years old. And what it said was there really aren't any articles written about naked suicide. So. It's not really a, an area of study because it's very, very rare. Women do not tend to do this um, naked suicide, let alone in public like this and outside. Um, and, you know, everybody who testified, they were all asked, have you heard of a case like this before? And everybody said, no. <laughs> The sheriff said, oh, there's plenty of literature out there. I'm like, well, no, actually there isn't because I looked for it. It isn't there. So. Um, that's, that's all I can say about that. Um, it's, it's not a common thing. It's very unusual. And that's why this case has gotten so much attention. I think what's my overall impression of Adam. I don't really want to give a personal opinion about that. Uh, I don't want to give a personal opinion about my overall impression about anybody in this book, other than maybe Rebecca, because she's gone. Um, and I didn't meet her. So all I know is what I learned from other people. And I said, I, you know, what I said. Um, I, the only thing I can say about Adam and even Jonah will say he thinks his brother is eccentric. You know, he's definitely an odd guy. Anytime he's quoted in the media, he's, you know, saying something usually defamatory about the Zahows or the Keith Greer or about his own legal team. Um, he seems very angry. But according to his girlfriend, that's not who he is. That he's actually a really nice guy, and you can read the book. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to give a personal opinion on that because that's not something I put into the book. Did 
did you get all you wanted from the Emmys? Do you suspect you've not the full evidence? Uh, well, I have the autopsy reports. I have the pictures. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything that's in the investigative file. Um, and they have uh, basically given their interpretation of the evidence, and it is that she committed suicide. So, oh, here we go. On CBS News, they reported that Adam had watched pornography prior to Rebecca's death. Yes, I did mention that earlier. Um, he woke up. Um, he had he pulled up porno on his phone, and he pleasured himself, and he took a shower, and then he went outside. So, um, there, one of the things I did want to clear up, though, is that there there have been some conflation of details about a computer in the house that had uh, been accessed and had porno. Someone looking at porno, but that was before Adam came to town. It was Rebecca's laptop. And I don't want to go into any detail more than that because it's a spoiler and I don't want to ruin it for anybody. But Adam did not look at porno inside the house. And I think that needs to be made clear. <clears throat> Let me just get some fluid here. Do you have any clue if there was some corruption with the police to cover this up? Um, there have been allegations by um, the Zahau's attorney that there's this case was not handled well. He at first thought it was incompetence, but now he thinks it's more corruption because how could you possibly interpret the evidence this way? Anybody can, you know, should be able to see that this is that Rebecca did not commit suicide. Um, he you know, implied and said essentially that he thought Sheriff Gore had been bribed. But when I asked him to explain what he meant by that, I said, there's nothing in the campaign reports I looked. There were no donations made to the sheriff's campaign by Jonah Shacknai or Adam Shacknai or any member of the Shacknai family. Um, and the sheriff was pretty upset about that. Um, and he denied there was anything, no special treatment for Jonah, no undue influence because of his wealth and no, no bribes or campaign donations intended to be bribes. And then Keith Gray later said, well, he didn't mean cash was handed over. He said he thought it was more subtle. So you'd have to ask him more specifically what he meant by that. Um, I don't have any evidence that there was corruption. So that's my thought on that. Um, I'm not gonna engage in a conspiracy theory, but I will tell you, that I had a woman who came up to me in Home Depot and said, you've got to prove who bribed the sheriff. And I'm like, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know, how am I going to do that? Um, sheriff says he wasn't. So, um, Everyone said that Rebecca was found naked in public, but the courtyard at the mansion was private, correct? Okay, so I did mention she was in public. What I meant was outside. Um, yes, it is private. However, the sheriff's department uh, detectives left her naked body on the grass all day and there were news helicopters flying over and you can see the pictures, they pixelated them out. And you know that's part of the reason that there's one theory that that's why they didn't find any DNA on the knife that Adam used to cut her down because they also left that outside in the sun and sunlight and heat can degrade DNA. So. That wasn't such a bright move. You know, they left her out there. They didn't cover her. Um, I guess there's something like a tent they could have used um, that I heard about recently. So uh, I'm going to do one more question because we said eight o'clock and we're now one minute till. Were any of Rebecca's exes investigated and to, as to their alibis? You know, I had that same question. Um, the only um, person that I know of that they interviewed was Neil Nalepo, was her ex husband. And he was accused by Rebecca. She told her family the reason she left him is because he had physically abused her. He denies this. Um, and he told the detectives that. They asked him about that. But he said he had an alibi, which was essentially that he was, I think, at a lecture and then at the gym, and that was in Arizona. And I don't know whether they checked that out or not. Um, but when I asked them about um, Neil being a suspect, 
they said he was never a suspect. So that's that. Anyway, thank, thanks everybody so much for all these great questions. Some of these were hard. You guys really, I felt like I was having a quiz here. <laughs> so thanks, thanks all for your interest. I, I hope you guys will read the book and I hope you'll approach this with an open mind like I did. I think some people approach this case and say, well, I thought she was murdered and when I finished reading your book, I still think she's murdered, but I learned a lot. <laughs> so I'm just, I, I love to hear from people what they think and if they change their minds um, and if I help them understand this better. Um, I hope that's the case because that was my goal. So thank you very much. Oh, where to buy the book? Sorry. Buy the book at Bay Books. If you're in Coronado, that'd be great. Um, I signed a bunch of books and I'm also gonna have a book signing there on May 16th, I think Sean mentioned. Um, from 12 to 2 p.m. outside at a table, COVID safe, um, Sunday, May 16th. But there are books there now, as far as I know, unless they're sold out. Um, and I'll be happy to sign more if they order more, which I think they will. Um, the other place, if you don't want to leave your house, if you're not in Coronado, if you happen to be watching this from out of town or out of state, the San Diego Public Library Bookshop is also selling copies that I've signed and personalized. Um, and they're gonna continue to do that for, for the next while. Um, and all that information is on my virtual tour calendar. There's links there, or you can go directly to the bookshop yourself and order it online. Um, and that's it. So thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate your, your interest. <laughs>